Welcome to National Arts, a unique program devoted to music, art, literature, and the theater world. Our guests on this first program will include internationally renowned Metropolitan Opera star and Grammy winner, James McCracken. Then we're going to meet the most prolific romance writer of the last five years. The author of 53 novels, Nora Roberts is the first writer ever elected to the Romance Writers of America Hall of Fame. From Broadway's newest musical, we'll meet actor Brian Mitchell, a gentleman whose role as Franklin in the production of Mail has earned him rave notices as a song and dance man. From the literary ranks, we're going to meet Heather McDonald, one of the up-and-coming young playwrights in America today. Most recently, she was awarded the prestigious Playwright Center McKnight Foundation Fellowship, which ultimately led to the moving drama Rivers and Ravines. Next, we'll talk to Casey Biggs, a young actor who's been cast in the lead role of the Broadway-bound Elmer Gantry. Biggs was cast in this role in the new musical adaptation of the Sinclair Lewis Pulitzer Prize winning novel, Quite by Accident. When they approached me about doing this, I was doing another show and it seemed sort of fatalistic that I did this because they called the people that are representing me and my, they wanted me to go to California and, and sit and wait to get a television pilot which is not my idea of a good time anyway, but they called and my agent said, he's not interested, he's not available. So I happened to go to a, a Christmas party where the writer was there and I said, oh, what's going on with your gantry show? And he said, we can't find a gantry, we've got everybody else. And I said, they gave me this big song and dance about wanting, being interested in me doing it. He said, do you sing? I said, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I sing. <laughs> and uh, so it happened that they were auditioning the next day and they started rehearsal three days later and they didn't have their lead and I went in and, and that's how I got the role. Well, you have three big roles now in the, in, in the course of a year. You've played uh, Travis, you played uh, Jack Burden, and now Elmer Gantry. Right. And it's quite that's, a year. It's an extraordinary year to play two of the, the greatest literary characters of our yeah. history. Elmer Gantry is a, let's suffice it to say, a cynical preacher of sorts, but he has a devouring love uh, for Sharon Falconer, who is a preacher as well. Well, it's very interesting. Uh, taking what Sinclair Lewis did in the book and using our... I had to leave the book alone a lot in order to do this show because it's not really the same same story. It is, but it isn't. Where you pick him up in our show, it's already a third through the book. And uh, he is... He's, he's not a loser, you know. He's a very feisty... I don't... He doesn't believe in God. You know, that's the interesting about him. In the end and yet of our, he's a minister. He's a showman, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, in the book, he, he grabs onto one sort of philosophy and starts going. In our show, he's, he's a salesman. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's down and out. He's unhappy with his work. And our show is set in the Depression, where the country is in desperate need of hope. And if you look sure. at what happened in our country at that time, this was flourishing, you know, people giving people hope. Look through the window at them nice married folk. It looks so cozy inside. So warm, he breaks his back every day. She tries to stretch out his bay to cover their needs, and she succeeds. Then at the end of the day, with everything in its place, they clasp their hands to say grace. Got nothing much else to say. picks up with Sharon Falconer, who somewhere where the, does think she has a connection up to God and is exploits he an, it. Is he an opportunist? Does he try to latch on to something that he realizes could be big, or is it really the devouring love that he has for Sharon Falconer that, no. that pulls him along? What no, is no, it that he does finds, it? he finds, he sees a quick buck, you know. Initially. And then all, he initially sees a quick buck, <laughs> and he sees something that he can produce and mold, and he knows uh, that he can produce this woman's show, but the, the thing is, is he's never met a woman. 
It's like in the book it says also, he said it's the first time he's had a devouring passion in his life when he meets some, when he meets Sharon Falconer. Mm -hmm. And gradually he falls in love, what he thinks is in love. There was an interesting comment and somebody overheard at halftime, halftime at intermission, mm -hmm. um, that they were, the wife and husband was arguing whether he was, Elmer was either in lust or in love with Sharon, which to me is exactly the thing that I want to have happen in the show. Mm -hmm. He does fall in love with her. Passion or reason. Right. Hard to tell. Right. It's, it's a combination of both, really. Oh, yeah, it's a very fine line. And it's a very dangerous line, too. It's interesting. Elmer Gantry is an opportunist who ultimately becomes used, and he has a hard time coping with that. I think he has a difficult time, not just at admitting that he's going to have to face the reality of a lost love, but he's built something that ultimately he's going to have to give up. And he can't accept that. No, I, mean, I, I just can't accept that. That's why I choose to leave. And, and ultimately, in the show, he doesn't really give it up. Hopefully, the, the audience is left a little ambiguous about what's going to happen. And when I'm sitting in an audience, I don't like to be told everything I should be thinking. I hope I like to have the audience have imagination of their own, and hopefully, I think successfully, we do that in this show. Playwright Heather McDonald's moving drama about the farm crisis in America, Rivers and Ravines, was the culmination of two years of research and hundreds of interviews with crisis victims. They were really the basis, the foundation on which the play grew from. Mm -hmm. uh, I did the majority of the interviews, but other people involved in the production, actors and the two directors, both were involved early on. Uh, it's not a documentary piece. There's no character based on anyone that I met. I wanted to um, capture the flavor of a place, and I don't think there's any way without having done the time in Colorado that I would have been able to create those voices. You wanted to get a feeling for a community in crisis, and you really got that, didn't you? There's no main character in the play. It really, the main character is the community mm -hmm. that you follow. It's not like a family or one person's story. So that I really wanted to, to interview all those people, and I wanted to be sure to uh, get the points of view that haven't always been represented so much, the banker's point of view. Who, sure. Uh, other people who are part of that community but mm -hmm. aren't necessarily being represented except as bad guys. And people don't come to town as much anymore because they're ashamed. Mm -hmm. So that it's not only are their businesses suffering, but the sense of community just shatters because people have such pride and then they don't want to come to town and be seen by anyone. I want to move her. I want to move the baby. You can't move a grave. It's not a grave. She's Margaret Ann. It's against the law. No one will care. Why do you want to move our baby? Because I got to make sure that a part of me is always here. That way they don't win. I win. I'm dug in. And whatever grows here, I'll be a part of it. You blame me? No. Talk to me, Tess. What about? I don't know. Things. Who do you think is going to win the World Series? Whether we should have hamburgers for dinner. What color do you want to paint the kitchen? I want to paint the kitchen yellow. OK. I like yellow. I'm losing my family's land. Tess, we're married. It's all mixed no, together. No, no, it's different. You don't understand. My dad gave this to me. Whatever is happening is happening to both no, of us. No, it's not. You married into this. I was born in. You know I have always done my best by you and your family. What this? You think this means the own land, John? Pieces of paper? Yeah, I believe I can do something with these pieces of paper. It's all over, don't you see it? It's all slipping away. I'm losing it for my dad. What are you saying, Tess? We should just let it all go? Yes. Just let it go, John. This production will be at the Arena Stage in mm -hmm. Washington, D.C. This will be its first showing. Right. I guess the big award for you would be the McKnight Fellowship. That's really helped you quite a bit in your playwriting, hasn't it? Yes, that was great because uh, it bought time. Actually, I used that to help buy my time to write this play for this year. Uh, part of the requirement of that, it's given by a foundation in Minneapolis. And part of the requirement is to go and spend time in Minneapolis to do something in their community, which uh, last summer I taught young, young playwrights when mm -hmm. I was out there. And as soon as this play opens, I go back for another month, and I'm probably going to do a workshop of this same play out there because 
there's been a lot of interest in Minneapolis. You've had some great commercial success at such a young age, and yet there are thousands of playwrights <laughs> out there that submit their plays on a daily basis and don't have that kind of success. What do you really attribute uh, your success to thus far? What really makes you stand out? I don't feel that successful. I mean, it's, uh, it's such a hit and miss business that you, you have a flurry of activity where you get a lot of work and then you're unemployed mm -hmm. for a couple years, which was my experience. Um, I just keep at it. I, you just, you have to keep writing. You know, you can't, I mean, I've had, I've had a lot of bad press, bad reviews, but you have to just keep going on to the next project so that that becomes the important thing and not not whether you're feeling successful or not because you'll be flavor of the month for this week but then next week you won't be. It is rare we get to see the musical talents of TV actors. A Broadway actor first, Brian Mitchell feels right at home with his new musical role in Mail. Franklin is kind of, it, with the pair, the, he's kind of like the idea man mm -hmm. in the group and Alex being the writer is the person who puts everything down in the concrete form that people can, can see. Um, Franklin I see as somebody who just spews 100,000 ideas in, in 10 seconds. He just comes out with all these ideas but he doesn't have the facility to, to solidify any of them and when Alex leaves town, Franklin is left with nothing and that's Franklin's crisis in the show is all of a sudden he kind of starts wondering, well, who am I and what am I doing? What am I doing here, too? The plot of Mail is really an interesting one when you think about it. It's the whole idea of an inanimate object coming to life, um, recreating somehow the last four months of a person's life through the mail that they receive at the front door. I mean, it's a fascinating concept yes. if you think about it. Yeah, it is. As a matter of fact, that's what attracted me to the play. I you know what I mean? Steam. That really, I guess, sums up their whole relationship, the fact that they are really good together. And then what happens when you two are separated, the world's set on fire by a black and a Jew, you don't know where he's gone, what's going to happen. And then uh, your final song, Friends for Life, they all exemplify how important a friend is not only in a personal relationship, but also in a business relationship. Yes. Some fascinating songs and some real challenges for you. You're quite a song and dance man. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when we watch you on Trapper John, uh, of course, we saw your acting talents for seven years. But most people don't realize that uh, there's an awful lot more to an actor than just acting on screen or on film, that generally they have good song and dance talents as well. Right. What happens a lot of times when you do a television show is that old familiar phrase, typecasting, mm -hmm. and people see you uh, on a national level, um, they see you doing one thing. So when people see somebody uh, act or sing or dance or, or walk upside down on a tightrope or do anything like that, mm -hmm. all of a sudden there's this incredible new thing that they don't realize that this, this person's doing when this person might have been trained in this for, for years. I started, actually I was raised in musical theater. I started doing that when I was 14 years old. Oh, so I didn't get into actually film style acting until I was 18 or 19. Now you're a prolific songwriter as well. I mean in your spare time you write jingles and different things. And yes. Some of your music's been used on series. And yeah. When do you find time to do that? 
in the spaces, yeah. <laughs> you find spaces sometimes. It's been frustrating now because with mail especially, and I was doing a lot of episodic television last year, mm -hmm. and I was also doing a recurring uh, role on another television show, mm -hmm. I had very little time to do the things that I really like to do, which is uh, writing music. And I find myself starting to get a little tense and a little uptight when, when I don't have the opportunity to do that. And now, of course, I don't, <laughs> I'm not able to do that because I don't have the uh, facility or anything around. I brought one of my instruments with me, but I haven't even had the chance to open it yet because of rehearsals and performances that we've been doing here. You began on the stage. You had great success uh, in commercial television, really because of a stage performance. Mm -hmm. You're back on stage now. You're going to Broadway. I get the feeling from the, uh, from the gleam in your eye when you talk about theater and Broadway that that's your biggest thrill. It is. What I missed a lot when I was doing Trapper John, and I didn't miss this for probably the first three years I was on it, was the live audience. The reason I didn't miss this was because since it was my first, season, the first uh, uh, television show I'd done, there were so many things to learn. And I was just constantly learning, and it was so exciting having other people and stars that I'd seen perform all my life come to me and to my show and perform, and learning from them and learning all the different camera techniques and everything. But after about three years and I'd gotten that down, I really started missing the live audience and that energy you get from, from performing live and the, the uh, thrill and the luxury of being able to rehearse. You don't get to rehearse at all in film. You maybe rehearse something four times before it's filmed and sometimes that's what you see on television. But here we get to play with things and change things and, and, and uh, just play around with them and try different things. and. Uh, and the nice thing about it is you can always, you, I think you can be a little bit more daring on, on stage mm -hmm. because even if you make a choice that doesn't quite work, you, you're not sure if it's going to work. If it doesn't work, you throw it out. You know you tried it and it didn't work and then you try something else until you refine it and you just keep refining it and it gets to that point where it's just... It's perfect. Uh, yeah, or as near perfect as you can get. Mm -hmm. And that's the thrill of the stage, I think, is being able to do that and having that one-on-one -on -one relationship with an audience. How does America's most prolific romance writer of the last five years come up with fresh ideas for her next work? Her secret started years ago. I always liked to make up stories in my head and uh, had never thought about putting them on paper until uh, I read more and more and more and started reading romance novels in particular and decided that uh, it was something I wanted to try. Did you think you could improve upon those that you were reading? Oh, I think you always do. I think, you know, you're very audacious about it. Well, I can do it so much better. Then you find out that because, especially in romance novels, the form is very simple. It looks very simple. So it's very difficult to produce. Now, 90% of every romance novel is the relationship between the man and the Absolutely. woman. Absolutely. Or the relationships. Yeah. Obviously, there can be love triangles and all that yes. involved. Um, how do you frame the rest of it? Where do you find your settings? Are they the more tropical climes where you would associate passion and what have you? Well, you can or? use that, but of course that's the easy way out. Mm -hmm. You know, using Des Moines is a, is a little tougher, but it can sure. be done. Yeah. Uh, anywhere, I've, I've set books in, in small towns, in big cities, on islands, mm -hmm. wherever, because really what it comes down to is the relationship between those two people. Where do you get your ideas for the romances and, and the relationships between people? Well, first you have to come up with the characters. And once you come up with two interesting characters, then you go with them. That's, that's first. And uh, how they play off each other, how they feel about each other, why they feel that way. Uh, usually you're going to have some sort of conflict between them right off the bat or else they'd get married on page two and you'd have no story. <laughs> so you have to, have to have some sort of give and take. Why don't they like each other right away? Or why are they attracted to each other right away? Not just because he has blonde hair and she has blue eyes. That's not enough. We're dealing with emotional commitment in, in a romance novel. It's very important. Y you find good characters. It's hard to let go. You have very some repeat much. people in a variety of the novels. Yeah, I, I like working with connecting books. And I think the reader enjoys it because they can catch up. Mm -hmm. What happened after, you know, happily ever after for these mm -hmm. people? If you bring them back in another book as sub-characters, you get to sort of catch up with them. Your titles are interesting. Hot Ice, that's one of your bigger ones. That's yeah. a definite oxymoron there, yeah. a contradiction of terms. Uh, Sacred Sin, where do you get your titles? Well, some of them I come up with, sometimes the publisher comes mm -hmm. up with them. If, if you try to f find some sort of hook, like with, with Hot Ice, something that uh, you know, is, is short and catches the attention. Um, using the oxymorons for the, my books for Bantam, my single title book, Sacred Sins is the next one. Mm -hmm. And then the one I have coming out in April is Brazen Virtue. 
It's the same sort of thing. <laughs> you know, we're playing on that. You're only as good as your next book. Is that true? Absolutely true. Does yeah. that become frightening to a certain extent? Do you feel pressured inside when you're writing a piece? You, yeah, I think you can never be complacent. You can never say, well, you know, that was a great book. Everyone loved it. So, you know, I can, so I can just skate through the next one. Every book is the first. Every time you sit down, you're writing your first book all over again. Is there an inexhaustible supply of romantic entanglements? Oh, I think so. It's, it's like saying there are 88 keys on the piano, but look what you can do with them. Can, can you draw? Like can you draw from the newspapers and things that you see? You can draw from from real life. You can draw from the newspapers. You can draw from uh, television, or you can just pull something out of your head, something completely off the wall. Yeah. Now you're working on one now. Is that correct? Oh yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about it? I'm working on one for Bantam right now. That's uh, a lot of it is set in the Middle East in a country mm -hmm. I made up in the Middle East, mm -hmm. where the heroine is the daughter of uh, a former movie star who married. Uh, the, the leader of this country and who turned out to be a really nasty sort of guy and this is much later on in her life through various circumstances she's living in the states now and has become a jewel thief mm -hmm. and uh, so that's how she uh, mm -hmm. makes her living. Do you ever run up to somebody or a friend or whatever and say what do you think of this idea or do you, I mean I would think that the tendency would be to get it very excited about a new concept a new romance or a new entanglement and want to share it with people. Um, You're almost yet, afraid to ta that she'll talk it out Ooh. See, so you don't, you, you do, you might with other writers, you know, you brainstorm, you kick around an idea or, or something like that, but it's, it's always, if you take it too far, you're, it's, it's sort of this thing that if I talk it through all the way, I'll be stale. You know, there won't be any surprises. It's a, it's a, a simple formula. If you feel a story coming on, write it down and try several times and maybe you'll be lucky enough to have the success that you have. Yeah. It's, uh, it takes a lot of self-discipline. Yes, it does. Yeah. And a lot of lonely nights by yourself. That's right. James McCracken was the first U.S.-born singer to perform the title role of Verdi's Otello. The role became his after one of the most lengthy audition processes in the history of opera. They had auditioned 42 tenors. I guess that's the exact amount, 42 tenors, and they couldn't find anybody that they would entrust to do the part, okay? So they gave me the part without, without ever having heard me, which was kind of strange, I thought. But uh, Ellen Fall had come back from Europe. We had sung together in uh, Yugoslavia. And she had come back and said, this, this voice can do Otello. And they took her word for it. And so I, they, they gave me a contract to come here. And I came here and I sang Otello. And yes, it was a very important time for me because it got me started. Yeah. And uh, from there, things really... The, the worked out well for me. Recording career was right around the same started, time. Too, started started right. about after right after that. Yeah. yeah, it all came together in a hurry. After sort of you once you get on that certain plane, why uh, you're all right. What happened after '63? Uh, you had the great success at the Met. Uh, how much longer did you remain there doing title roles? Yes, I sang in '63, and then uh, Mr. Bing was the, the leader at the at the Met, then the top man, and uh, I guess I stayed there pretty much until in the '70s sometime. All your great roles are, um, I guess, the who's who among operatic performances. Um, and, of course, the one in particular that uh, you are performing currently is Fidelio. You're performing Floristan. Yes. Uh, I haven't done Floristan in America uh, so much. I've done it, I did it with the Boston Symphony in Tanglewood, which was a wonderful uh, performance of it. Mm -hmm. And I've done it at the Met maybe four or five times. And the... I won't be able to tell you all the places, but probably a couple of hands full is all I've done in America. Mm -hmm. And then just this year, I went out to California and did it in San Francisco, the same production that we're doing here in, in, in uh, Washington, D.C. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful piece. It, it is. a happy it's, it's ending. It's a very, very beautiful opera. We don't lose our heroine or no, our hero in this I one. and I don't have to stab anybody or <laughs> commit any terrible sins. But your wife actually saves you. One of the interesting things to always talk to a singer about is how their voice matures. Um, 
we've been told male voice doesn't really mature until age 35, and so that can be the beginning of a lot of people's careers. Yes, it can. I, I agree with that. I, I sang earlier than that some very dramatic things, but um, yes, you don't have to be... It seems to me that the coloratura voices are very often young. Why that should be, I don't know. But the coloraturas can even be in their teens and, uh, and uh, sing well. But I, the, the, the female voice, the dramatic voices, the thicker, the heavier the voice, more than likely it takes a while to, to develop mm -hmm. and get them so they can be handled well. Now, this has been a busy year for you, as I remember reading some materials. Uh, you actually had a performance at Carnegie Hall, did you not, this yes, past year? Yes, uh, just in December. Mm -hmm. uh, it was La Fiamma, and it's never done. Mm -hmm. And it was a result of La Fiamma that a lot of these uh, the things that I'm going to do next year, mm -hmm. uh, um, because it was a very big success. And uh, I liked the music very much. The critics were hot and cold on it, but uh, uh, they liked the performance. That They didn't know whether they liked the music that much. I thought I think it's great music. It's Respighi. And I just, uh, of course, I'm, I like uh, a lot of the things that <laughs> critics don't like, but never mind. What does the remainder of 88 hold for you? This year I have um, uh, five performances at the Met in, in May. No, in uh, April. Uh, Trovatore. Uh, it's a new production. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been done about six or seven times, and now I'm going to do it. And then again in October, I do five performances of uh, Trovatore. In May, I do the, the girl leader out in, um, it's called the, the Orchestra of the Pacific, mm -hmm. and it's in Orange County in a new facility that's only been open about a year and a half. They say it's terrific, the acoustics and everything about it. And this is, uh, this is the piece that requires an uh, augmented orchestra. It's a larger-than-life orchestra. It requires two choruses. And... Uh, I think it's for soloists. When was it that you decided that you really wanted to be a serious singer? I mean, what, what was the first momentum in that area? Well, I don't remember when I didn't want to be a singer. I, I as a kid, just loved to sing. And uh, uh, I sang in high school all the Gilbert and Sullivans, mm -hmm. and even before high school, in grade school. And there, there, I, I, any time that anybody wanted somebody to sing, I'd sing. It would make a difference what it was. Uh -huh. I just loved to sing since, since I was very young. Broadway actor, opera singer, playwright, and fiction writer. We've met some pretty impressive people on this program. So until next time, remember, art was meant to be appreciated, so be a part of it. I'm Mike Baker. <laughs>